one of the some of the feedback that I get suggests that sometimes the conversation gets to a point whereby a lot of the issues that are being discussed do not get discussed properly and sometimes everybody who's not at a particular level of understanding on a particular topic uh, is able to engage it or understand completely what is going on and I think that um, it's important to be able to engage conversations in a way that we that we can carry people along with us in terms of overstanding, yeah? Um, and at least inspire and give people methods and ways and means to do further investigation and further research should they so choose, okay? Um, and so recently, because we've been dealing with issues such as Grenada Revolution, uh, Wagwan in, in Guinea and Burkina Faso and Mali and Niger and Gabon um, and touching on other places like Rwanda and Ghana and Congo um, and, you know, them kind of subject there. And obviously because last week, you know, I was talking about um, Charles of Windsor, fee visit to Kenya, we went into some things, yeah. Um, and then we just started to discuss a lot of different issues pertaining to economics and economic development, okay. And so what I'm going to do today is try to slow the conversation down a little piece uh, and speak to an specific element of the conversation that allows us to go into a little bit more detail all right um and hopefully with that uh the conversation the nature of the conversation becomes more productive because we're slowing things down enough to explain things and even among those who feel that they are they have a, a requisite level of knowledge to engage the conversation we're laying the platform to engage the conversation more productively, okay? I'm, I'm not a gladiator. I'm not in a gladiator business, yeah? And I, I love a good debate, you know, and, I, and when, it, when, when it comes time to debate, I debate as vigorously and rigorously as the best of them. However, I'm very much not into the, the gladiator arena style of internet shenanigans, yeah? I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, thing there. I've never been attracted to that vibration. Um, and so I don't want to, I don't want to create, I don't want this platform to become an example of it. And so we're gonna take some time now, yeah, like I said, to the slow the conversation down a little piece, all right? And, um, you know, hopefully this is a productive <coughs> contribution to some of the discourse that we've been having. So right about now, I'm going to share my screen. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen. And um, and as you can see here, kings and queens, we're going to deal with uh, a particular subject, all right? Because last week, we did a discuss GDP, yeah, little piece. Um, and so we're going to get deeper into GDP and what it is. And as you can see, the title of the show, yes, the title of the show is Economic Deceptions Explored, all right? And specifically today, we're going to deal with GDP. How about that? All right? So the, the, the title of the presentation that we are about to engage is GDP. How about that? All right. Oh, by the way, let me just make sure everybody can see my um my screen. So it's showing on my side. So I'm assuming everybody can see, but let me clarify that first. Yeah. So everybody can see ice screen. Everybody can see ice screen. Let me know if you can see ice screen. If I, you know, I'm, I'm going to large up the, the screen a little piece more and small up myself. Yeah. And I'm even going to disable the banner for a little period of time. All right. So just give me a signal. Let me know so you can see the presentation. Good, 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 good. And then we're going to forward it. Anything. Like up the video, kings and queens. Like up the video and share it, share it, share it far, far, far and wide, 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 wide. Oh, and see the things. All right. Okay. Um, so, yeah. All right. So, give thanks for Kushti and Imhotep for making me know. Bring it up. My brother Daniel over there in Manchester. Oh, yeah, I mean. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, I mean. So, bring it yourself, king. All right. So, GDP. I want that. All right. So first and foremost, it's necessary for us to understand that GDP 
uh, means gross domestic product. It's an acronym for gross domestic product, yeah? And so we begin, as I usually do, often do, uh, because I'm a student of Amos Wilson. So Amos Wilson often tells us, teaches us that we must deal with the metaphysics before we deal with the physics. In other words, we must break things down, yes, and define the concepts um, and how we are relating to the concepts and our intentionality within the concepts before engaging the process of what we want to do, yeah, what we're trying to achieve and them kind of things there, okay? We must understand and approach things from an understanding of what something is yeah and so um I, as you may know i'm not an economist but i am a student um uh of i'm a pan-african student which means that we engage political economy and so um as a student i'm going to share some of what i've learned over the years in relation to this particular subject of gdp okay so gross is total without deduction yeah, it's the total of a thing without deductions. The total with deductions would be considered a net. Okay, uh, and we'll come back to that uh, in a little bit later uh, in the presentation. Domestic is existing or occurring inside a particular country. In the context of this uh, concept of GDP, we're talking about with in a particular nation state yeah and really what i should have put there is nation state because um that's more specifically what we are referring to okay the borders of a nation state all right um and then product is an article or substance that is manufactured or refined for sale an article or substance that is manufactured or refined for sale so we've broken down the basic uh meaning of the words that make up the term gdp but what is gdp more specifically uh from an economic point of view within the context of an economic definition yeah what is gdp so we get this definition as you can see and by the way my sources are generally going to be listed on the slide yeah so if you're looking for sources i may not always say them but if you're looking for sources look at the slide good 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 and generally speaking you'll see the source all right gdp measures the monetary value of final goods and services pay attention to the underlines and highlights final goods and services that is those that are bought by the final user produced in a country in a given period of time say a quarter or a year it counts all of the output generated within the borders of a country gdp is composed of goods and services produced for sale in the market and also includes some non-market production such as defense or education services provided by the government okay all right so let's break this down just a little piece more yeah first and foremost when we are discussing monetary value so gdp is measured in money okay it's not measured in things products uh material produce it's measured in money and within the current economic system, the monetary value of dominance is the dollar. Yes, uh, the dollar, which is pegged uh, uh, to the nation state of the United States of America, because this is the currency that comes from that nation. OK, so in other words, the uh, global economy as we know it, is measured according to its dollar value and also in order to trade in this global economy you have to use the dollar so you can't use naira yeah uh you can't use cd you can't use yen although the, the chinese they might try try a thing yeah where that is concerned at the moment all right they might try shift the <laughs> the, the balance here yeah, in these things all right um sorry japan is yen isn't it what am I, what am I, what am I saying about china all right uh you can and even if you, your currency name dollar yeah you can't use it so you can't use no jamaican dollar yeah if you want go um if you want to buy some banana if you're in a jamaica and you want to buy some banana from Barbados, you can't buy your banana. 
in an Jamaican dollar, not an Agosa. All right. You have to use the American dollar. And so the global economy, in effect, is centralized around the value of the American dollar. And this gives uh, the American market and its dollar value uh, some privileges in the sense of the fact that the American dollar, because everybody has to trade in it, generally speaking, remains a very strong currency in the world and is a very stable currency in the world, yeah, generally speaking, okay? All right, I saw the thing go, yeah? Okay, so that's one element of the thing, all right? Um, uh, and as it relates to, the, I mean, like, but generally speaking trade has to be uh, uh, performed within uh, um, the monetary value of the american dollar okay so when we say final goods and services what do we mean very briefly yeah so if if you, you have kalalu this is some kalalu yeah all right and kalalu is an agricultural product yeah so you Produce kalalu, the, the farmer in produce some kalalu. But if the farmer, yeah, sell a kalalu to a restaurant, it is considered an intermediate good. And so the selling of the kalalu to the restaurant does not in the measurements of GDP directly, okay? Because it's an intermediate good, and as you this, this, the, the um defined within the context of GDP, we are talking about final goods and services. So when that kalalu becomes registers in GDP, is is bought by the consumer in the restaurant. Yeah, the logic here is that the value of the kalalu in its raw state is included in the price of the kalalu when it is sold as a dish okay so until it is sold at its final stage in terms of a final product to a consumer it is considered an intermediate good all right then that goes for all resources yeah okay that goes for all resources as far as they operate within an economy okay so if now uh that kalalu is sold straight, yes, to the consumer at market, then it is it, it contributes to GDP, okay? I'll give another example. If you sell a, a, um, a natural resource from one country to another, yeah, um, that would contribute to GDP, okay? But if the, that metal is sold within the country and then that metal is used, to create another manufactured good, then it would only count to GDP when that manufactured good is sold. All right. Okay, I hope that's making sense to everybody so far. So we're just overstanding what GDP actually is, yeah? So there are a few um, indicators in terms of what makes up GDP. The main calculations, the main indicators are government spending, investment spending, and consumer spending, all right? Let's bear those things in mind. We're not going to um, dwell upon this part here, but just to say that the equation is GDP equals consumer plus investment plus government spending plus net exports. And net exports is everything that is exported from the country minus the value of everything that is imported into the country okay so i must have said gross total without deduction net is total with related deductions all right so net exports is everything that is sold to to outside of the country minus everything that is uh imported into the country okay all right so bear that in mind yeah that makes up the g d p yeah now Remember, I said they show name Economic Deceptions Explored, yeah? And the reason why we are addressing this is because of the fact that in today's world, this calculation 
GDP is often used to measure the health of an economy. And so the higher your GDP for the uninformed, the unlearned, and the uninitiated, the more wealthy your economy is, the more healthy your economy is, the more developed your nation is, yeah? And an ex example of this is the fact that we, we've heard for the last decade or so that eight or nine of the fastest growing economies in the world are on the African continent, and this is being measured by GDP, okay? but when this particular calculation and this measurement is used what is ob often not included in the conversation are the limitations of gdp and this gentleman is a man by the name of simon kuznets simon kuznets he happens to be the person who is credited with coining the phrase and developing the framework of GDP, gross domestic product, context, 1930s America within and coming out of the so-called Great Depression. And that's very important context here. Yeah? So note, please note the context in which this framework developed. It was a framework developed in order to create a indicator uh, for measuring the development or lack thereof of the American economy and solving some of its problems that became manifested in the so-called Great Depression. And uh, he, the person who coined the phrase GDP, says the following uh, in terms of uh, a paper that he wrote for Congress in America His paper um, called National Income, yeah, 1922, 9 to 1932. All right. And I believe the paper was published in 1937. Yeah. Um, I, I will double check that because that should have been listed here, but I'll double check that and uh, correct it uh, if I'm incorrect a little later on. All right. So um, he says, with quantitative measurements, especially the defi definitiveness. Sorry, the definiteness of the result su suggests often misleadingly a precision and simplicity in the outlines of the object measured. Yeah. So what is effectively saying here in the context specifically of GDP? That the equation and the, what comes the e after the equal sign could suggest a definiteness, yeah, and often lead uh, a precision that is not in as precise and as definite as it might appear with quantitative measurements especially the definiteness of uh, the results suggest often misleadingly a precision and simplicity in the outlines of the object measured measurements of national income are subject to this type of illusion and resulting abuse, especially since they deal with matters that are at the center of conflict of opposing social groups, where the effectiveness and argument is often contingent upon oversimplification. All right, this is very what everybody is saying here is very important. Yeah, All right. so. We're dealing with, again, the limitations of GDP. And what we're saying here is that there are some things that GDP does not measure, yes? And he's ever to say that the fact that it does not measure these things, yeah? And the fact that it appears to be more precise and exact than it, than it is, and I'm going to add uh, more all-encompassing than it is, leaves it open to being abused especially when conflicting groups ideas within a society yes begin to access uh, and analyze the information 
And because of the fact that political debate is often, uh, often requires an oversimplification of very complex ideas and concepts, the, it, this makes uh, numerical figures or quantitative measurements really prime tools for misleading and creating a facade of precision where one does not exist. He goes on, all these qualifications upon estimates of national income as an index of productivity are just as important when income measure measurements are interpreted from the point of view of economic welfare. Okay? Economic welfare. Now, that's important because gross domestic product does what it says in the tin. It's measuring production. It's not necessarily measuring welfare. Okay, bear that in mind. But in the latter case, additional difficulties, the latter case is economic welfare, will be said in, in the latter case, additional difficulties will be suggested to anyone who wants to penetrate below the surface of total figures. Notice the language penetrate below the surface of total figures and market values. Economic welfare cannot be adequately measured unless the personal distribution of income is known. Repete. Economic welfare cannot be adequately measured unless the personal distribution of income is known and no income measurement undertakes uh, to estimate the reverse side of income that is the intensity and unpleasantness of effort going into the earning of income now this is very significant yeah if you look at studies of uh industrialization um you know, particularly after the 1850s going into the early 20th century, there's a lot of talk about the working conditions that people were being subjected to. There's a lot of conversation about child labor, um, you know, and, and, and uh, I remember going to school, for example, and there's a particular substance uh, that they had to check because they, they, they used to make buildings of this particular substance and it turned out to be toxic, yeah? Um, and so in the 19, in the late 80s, early 90s, they were going through the process of outmoding the use of this particular... And I can't remember what the substance is, you know? But can't wait, 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 didn't name, yeah? But another example would be, would, would be lead. Yeah, lead in our paint and all them thing there, all right? Um, and then you have, you know, mining work where, uh, you know, quite dangerous work, but people were often not provided with the proper materials um to to be to protect themselves to be safe on the job and so on and so forth yeah now in all these all these examples economic growth was taking place but the and people were being relatively yeah uh quote unquote well paid especially when you consider um how well sorry how well paid they might have been prior to the development of these industries but the, 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 the level of income and even an increase in their level of income doesn't take into consideration what exactly they have to engage in to receive that income. Yeah. All right. So at, and no income measurement undertakes to estimate the reverse side of the income. That is the intensity and unpleasantness of effort going into the earning of income the welfare of a nation can therefore scarcely be inferred from a measurement of national income as defined above the welfare of a nation can therefore scarcely be inferred from a measurement of national income as defined above and that's uh, elsewhere in the paper which i haven't necessarily included here credited with coining the frame the framework that becomes known as g gross domestic product yeah and here are a, a list and very this i've got this I've compiled this list from various different sources so it's effectively um you know my own kind of compilation here but 
drawing on various different sources that I've studied over time. All right. Um, and so we we have, and I'm not, I'm not going to go into it. You can come back and read everything whilst you're here. Um, sorry, when you come back, if you can pause, I'm, you know, and, and read. I'll read the list and then I'm going to give you a framework, one framework that I came across um, uh, for breaking this down in, in even simpler terms. Yeah. So you got, so this, these are things, a list of indicators. Yes. That do not factor into gross domestic product measurements. All right. A list of indicators that do not factor in gross domestic product indicators. So you've already alluded to well-being and quality of life. Yes. Um, sustainability. Yeah. Um, and I, I will read this one. It's uh, the ability of a system to maintain itself sufficiently indefinitely into the future. So a basic example of this is that, uh, you know, if you're, if you're developing an industry based upon access to a specific natural resource but the natural resource is limited uh in its uh supply gdp will not measure that sorry that means let's say that the um the the natural resource is very limited in its supply and at the rate at which you're using it it's going to run out in five years there's a lack of sustainability within that industry okay um and gdp does not account for this yeah, it does not account for this in its measurement. OK, um, income inequality, which we'll come back to in a second. Uh, Non-market transactions. Yeah, which we'll come back to in a second as well. Negative externalities, um, which is, well, we're going to cut this in a second as well. Then there's real GDP per capita, um, and which we discussed quite significantly last week. And we're going to discuss a bit more later on as well. And then there's the depreciation of capital. Yeah, how your the value of your money. Uh, fluctuates over time. All right. Now, one framework that I've come across that helps us to break this these limitations down is the PIES framework. PIES, yeah. PIES, pollution, inequality, environment, and shadow economy. Yeah. Just to explain, pollution, yeah, would be included in what is called a negative externality. Yes, in economic terms, GDP does not account for the extent to which the industry that you are engaged in, no matter how wealthy it makes you or the nation in particular, no matter how wealthy, uh, no matter how much it contributes to the gross domestic product, GDP will not account for the extent to which your engagement in that industry pollutes the environment. All right. Um, the obvious... Uh, climate change and so on and so forth. Wherever, wherever you stand on, on the veracity of the claims yeah, that are made by the scientists or not, what will appear to be clear is that a significant amount of pollution <laughs> exists uh, in our environment, particularly, uh, but not exclusively, in industrialized nations uh, and nations uh, that harbor raw materials that contribute to uh, industrialized nations. Yeah. Uh, another example of this, as far as it relates to the UK, is the fact that we have a privatized uh, water industry. All right. Most of us, if not all of us, uh, receive water into our homes from private companies who uh, routinely uh, 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 expel sewage. Yes. Into rivers. And streams. Yeah. Um, and coastlines, okay? And so that's become a very big issue over the last few years in the UK. Um, but th that fact would not be taken into consideration in terms of GDP, even though it has a direct impact yeah, on the ecology and also the quality of life yeah, of the people that live in a nation and in a community. Then there's inequality. I'm not going to go into this one right here. I'm not going to go into it a little more. All right. Um, um, the environment. So, you know, that, that's everything, including the pollution. But that's everything um, from uh, tropical, you know, versus not so tropical uh, versus how much um, arable land, yeah, is in 
the the um the nation or you know what I'm saying these things are not measured yeah in GDP all right then you have the shadow economy yeah the shadow economy um also referred to as non market transactions yeah and this could be anything from cooking your food in your, in your house uh child care which is often uh doesn't uh doesn't result in a monetary transaction especially not one that is uh registered formally um it might include anything like that or criminal activity yeah so ganja yeah it now contribute to the gdp all right um and particularly important for us the massive amounts of corruption that our nations experience as far as, far as governmental corruption in Africa and the Caribbean will not be measured via GDP in the context of GDP. Okay, that's a shadow economy. So it could mean anything that's from legal activity to illegal activity that is not registered and measured uh, in a monetary value officially within the economy, all right? Pies, pollution, but environment, shadow economy. I hope ones and ones are overstanding and appreciating that so far, okay? Then, so let me tell you inequality now. Yes, one of the more obvious and probably primary initial indicators that is used here um, to deal with the issue of inequality is to go from GDP to measuring GDP per capita. Domestic product per capita. And this is acquired by uh, looking at the GDP, taking the gross domestic product and then dividing it by the population of the nation. And what that figure should give you, notice the use of the word should, is an average of how much each individual, yes, in the nation uh, receives or uh, 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 um, as, sorry, how much of the total GDP each individual in the nation receives. Yeah. Oh, we really appreciate that. Also, when may I say, okay. All right. So it's an average figure. Yeah. Um, and again, the general principle is that higher GDP healthier wealthier uh nation and more people in the nation have a higher standard of living all right so basic breakdown of this nation a nation b nation uh both nation a and nation b have a gdp of one million dollar yeah and we are staying with the dollar because america yeah <laughs> run things around you you know what i mean so we have to measure it, measure it in a dollars, all right? So one million. But the population of nation A is 100 people. The population of nation B is 500 people, all right? Okay. So as a result of this, yeah, as a result of this, the... Uh, GDP per capita. So the average that every person in nation A is going to receive a year. So I should I should also say that per capita is um, uh, per year. All right, is ten thousand dollar. All right, um, but in nation B we are dealing with two thousand. Yeah. Okay. So even though the productive capacity of both nations, yeah, nation A and nation B, would be equal. Yes. On the face of it, the quality of life in nation A would be might be significantly better than the quality of life, or let's say the average income in nation A would be significantly more than the uh Average income in nation B based purely 
yes, on the fact that less people actually live, yeah, in um, nation A, okay? So their productive capacity is basically equal, but there are variables below the surface that also need to be taken into consideration, yeah? Okay, and so this is why when uh, GDP per capita was mentioned last week, yes, um, I began to say, and didn't necessarily delve into the explanation because of time, that one would need to consider population. Yeah, when you're measuring GDP per capita, you need to look at exactly what is the population as well as what is the GDP, okay? Uh, because that will give you a better sense of who the, the kinds of numbers that are being catered for within the context of this GDP. Brother Imhotep also mentioned inequality, okay, inequality. And uh, we're going to get into that in a second, yeah, um, as well. All right. So two nations that were discussed quite heavily last week um, were Haiti and the Bahamas. All right. So I thought, all right, well, after I did that little example, I thought, actually, let me add a, a specific, yeah, example that relates to real terms. And th these figures are from um, 1920, sorry, not 1921, 2021, all right, um, uh, specifically, okay? So we have Haiti, we already discussed last week, and Bahamas, yeah? And, uh, may, may I apologize right here now to Brother Buana, if you're listening. Uh, yes, we are using Bahamas as our example again. Uh, you know, let's say it go. But we're also using Haiti, so maybe you don't think that um, it's just Bahamas again. All right. So um, now I believe the statement was made. Hello, my princess. How are you? Good, good, good. So I'm king, so king. My daughter just come home. Um, we must know. Right. Yeah, I believe it was said that the the GDP of the Bahamas. Um, is actually more than the GDP of Haiti, yes? And, and, I, and I did the research that it, it, it seems to me that that is incorrect, yeah? So uh, the GDP of Haiti is 20.94 billion, all right? Annually, yeah? Uh, the equivalent in Bahamas is 11.21 billion. All right. Okay. So the actual GDP of Haiti is almost double that of the Bahamas. However, however, the population of Haiti is over 11 million people yeah almost 11 and a half million people whereas <laughs> whereas yeah the population of the bahamas is little more than 400,000 people all right so there's a significant disparity in population yeah in relation to these things so as a result, even though the raw GDP of Haiti is double almost the GDP of Bahamas, yes, the actual GDP per capita in the Bahamas, yes, in the Bahamas is nearly three times that of the uh, GDP, sorry, significantly more than three times, let me not talk about, yeah, of the GDP in Haiti. Yeah. As you can see here, 1,828 versus 28,000 and little. All right. Okay. So when we're looking at wealth as far as these two nations is concerned, yeah. It will be inadequate. Our analysis would be fundamentally inadequate if we did not take into consideration uh, the significant disparity in the population. All right. Okay. And that's without going into 
an, a, a deep analysis of exactly how, what contributes to Haiti's GDP versus what contributes to Bahamas GDP. Yeah. We're going to allude to that little more, but we're not going to allude to it specifically in relation to these examples. Okay. All right. So another aspect of, of inequality now, yeah, um, is in relation to, sorry, let me, let me say this. Then when you're looking at GDP per capita, you also have to look at exactly how that wealth is in fact distributed. So the other thing that GDP and GDP per capita does not tell you is because it's providing an average, it doesn't tell you about the distribution of that wealth. Yeah? Okay? So we shouldn't assume that because the GDP per capita is 1,000 and blow all, and the GDP per capita is 28,000 and blow all, that the majority of the people are in fact earning that amount. I wonder if I know what I said. All right. And an, an example of this, yeah, you, you, what, that will require you to have to actually look at the assets, the corporations, the businesses, and see who owns what and who's earning from what. And then you'll be able to get uh, an idea of distribution. An example of this, one of the most obvious examples, is that today in South Africa, 73% of all agricultural land is owned by Anglobors. White people them in South Africa. Them 3% yes, of agricultural land in South Africa. Despite being only 8% of the population. Equivalently, 4% of agricultural land is owned by Africans, black people in South Africa, despite being 80% of the population. Yes. All right. Bear in mind now that um, in South Africa, they differentiate between blacks and coloreds. Yeah, so this figure doesn't take into consideration those Africans who have European ancestry, maybe half European or not even that, unless generationally uh, made up of those who are mixed, if that makes sense. All right. So there's a significant disparity in access to a primary natural resource, i.e. land, which does and has a significant impact on economic production. So when you see levels of inequality like this, it would generally indicate that wealth and income is being concentrated in a small minority of the population. That is not accounted for in measurements of GDP and GDP per capita, okay? All right, but well, ones and ones appreciate and understand when me ask them, I'm going slowly, yeah, deliberately to carry everybody along. And if you don't know this already, I apologize for moving so slow, but feel free to click the link that is pinned to the top of the chat and come through when I open up the lines and share and contribute to uh, what is being shared here because I'm sure so someone will know, know more than me on them, them subject here. All right. Okay. Have more expertise in the arena, in them feel Yeah. Okay. So I hope ones and ones appreciate that. Yes. Now, gross domestic product versus gross national product. An alternative concept, this is by, uh, again, the International Monetary Fund, and I, I hope ones and ones appreciate that I'm using definitions from very well-known 
neo-colonial imperialist institutions. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because we you know, tap in and, you know, use them as a resource certain time too. All right. So once and once, I appreciate love the vibes there. All right. So an alternative concept to gross national product is GNP. Gross. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me read it wrong. An alternative concept, gross national product, or GNP, different from GDP now, counts all the output of the residents of a country. Yes? So, for example, if a German-owned company has a factory in the United States, the output of this factory would be included in US GDP. Sorry. Yes, but in German GNP. All right. So I hope that makes sense. Yeah. So again, I'll read that last part again. So if a German owned company has a factory in the United States, the output of this factory would be included in US GDP. That's gross domestic product. Yeah. Uh, but in German, GNP, gross national product. Okay? All right. So if that don't make sense completely, let me let me break it down like this, specific to African reality. All right? So now, as I said earlier, mm -hmm. one of the statistics that we're hearing from the IMF and uh, Financial Times, and I believe the Financial Times is the the publication that coined the phrase Africa rising, Africa's rising, and Africa is open for business. And the idea is this is being measured again by GDP. We're looking at the fact that uh, there's a there's a two to four, I believe it is in that region, uh, uh, or two to five percent GDP growth annually over a certain period of time in certain African nations. Yeah. However, remember. If a foreign corporation owns a company that operates in a few nation that contributes to your nation's GDP. All right. So we, 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 we go to a, a paper, an article that you can download, you can find. It's called The New Colonialism, Britain's Scramble uh, for... Africa's Energy and Mineral Resources, published by an organization called The War on Want. And from the abstract, it says, this report reveals the degree to which British companies now control Africa's, mineral, Africa's key mineral resources, notably gold, platinum, diamonds, copper, oil, gas, and coal. It documents how 101 companies listed on the London Stock Exchange most of them British, have mining operations in 37 sub-Saharan African countries. Notice the use of the term sub-Saharan. So when, when I, when, we're not even a deal with North Africa, right? You know, when it's a talk about sub-Saharan, so-called. And I hate the terminology, but them use it, yes, sir. And we know what it means, all right? Okay. They collectively control over one trillion worth of Africa's most valuable resources. The UK government has used its power and influence to ensure that British mining companies have access to Africa's raw materials. This was the case during the colonial period and is still the case today. The 101 London Stock Exchange listed companies are mainly British, with 59 incorporated in the UK and the further. 12 incorporated in the British tax havens of Guernsey and Jersey. Many of the remaining companies are actually based in London, despite their country of incorporation. Of the 101 companies, 25 are incorporated in tax havens. In other words, sorry, I should have put a definition for this in here. A tax haven is basically a, a, a country where you can register a company and operate and pay little or no tax. Yeah. And tax havens are fundamental um, to, to, uh, to quote unquote free market economics 
because market fundamentalists so free market or quote unquote laissez faire uh, uh, capitalism uh, sees optimal viability in and economic and political situations that don't require companies and corporations to pay tax and especially not significant levels of tax yeah and so oftentimes in the global economy you can shift where your country is based based upon where you are paying the least amount of tax all right that's a, that's the definition of a tax haven okay all right um Many of the remaining companies are actually based in London despite their country of incorporation. Of the 101 companies, 25 are incorporated in tax havens. These 101 companies now control an identified 1.05 trillion <coughs> worth of resources in Africa in just five commodities, oil, gold, diamonds, and coal, platinum. This is a very conservative figure since it includes resources listed by only some companies many companies provide few or no figures on the resources they control so that last sentence relates to the if you're paying attention shadow economy okay why is this relevant because one of the things that gdp does not measure okay is the actual productive capacity of the people them will live in a nation in other words it is possible for your gdp to rise based upon the existence and operations of a foreign corporation that is really boosting the gross national product of the nation from which that corporation comes the existence of that corporation in our few nation does not necessarily come capacity of the people them for example a number of these um nations that are listed on these uh five to eight i can't remember the exact number uh fastest growing economies on the african continent is based upon uh chinese foreign direct investment fdi yes but Oftentimes, this does not have an appreciable impact upon the living standards or the income levels or the GDP per capita of the actual citizens of the nation. Because oftentimes, Chinese corporations are known for flying in. Yes, for them owner people. Kondisai. Kondisai. Sorry, kings and queens. Do not. Sorry, kings and queens. Parenting always oh, have to go on. All right. Um, yeah, does not necessarily contribute to the living standards and the income of the citizens of that nation. Yeah. Okay. So remember, we are talking about economic deceptions. So the GDP of that nation may rise. Yes, and the GDP per capita of that nation may increase. It doesn't actually mean necessarily, I shouldn't say actually, it doesn't necessarily mean that there is a, a real time, a real increase in the income of the people them in a nation. All right. Bear those things in mind. Okay. All right. And so we have for us deal with the fact that our luminaries from our generation and two ago don't tell we all the things already. All right. So Nkrumah in neocolonialism, the last stage of imperialism, gives some examples of this reality. He says in some countries, for example, Gabon and Zambia, up to half of the domestic product is paid to resident expatriates and overseas firms who own the plantations and mines. Over half of the domestic product is paid to foreigner and foreign corporations. So if over half of the domestic product, yes, is concentrated in these expatriates, that means the other half, presumably, is has to be shared between the rest of the oil people in the nation. 
in Guinea Bissau, which is Guinea Bissau today, Angola, Libya, Swaziland, South Africa, so sorry, Southwest Africa, and Zimbabwe, foreign firms' profits and settler or expatriate incomes exceed one third of the domestic product. Algeria, Congo, and Kenya were in this before independence. In 1962, petroleum and petroleum products contributed to 9.9%, sorry, contributed 9.9% to Nigeria's exports. But it is Shell BP that hopes to reap the most of the benefits. Um, and bear in mind, this book was written in 1965, and that is still the case today. Okay. All right. Not, not the percentage, I mean, but the fact that Shell and BP and then Chevron and ExxonMobil um, own mo earn most of the benefits. Yeah, that, that reality still persists today. The bulk of these exports was in crude oil, exceeding 3 million tons. The oil company is aiming at an export target of 5 million tons of crude oil by 1965. Processing plants are in Europe, not in Nigeria. And so one of the, the, the major ways here um, you know, like they say, um, uh, the gross national product is the exports minus, yeah, the imports, yeah. We have an export deficit, import-export deficit in most of our nations because we import far more than we export. And what the cost of what we import is far more than the cost of what we export. And oftentimes we are importing products that were made from the natural resources that we exported. Okay, it's a significant problem. The oil refinery going up in Portaco is owned by Shell BP. The natural gas piping is owned by Shell Barclays DC and O. The oil refinery is meant to handle only 10% of Nigeria's crude oil output and its products will serve only Nigeria's domestic market. Such an arrangement makes it possible to not sorry, not to disturb operations outside Nigeria while making super profits on Nigerian operations. What that means is that they're developing this, um, this refinery where they own, so they're in a position to, to earn the most from it, and, they're in, and in owning it, they're confining the extent to which it can contribute to uh, uh, development or the extent to which the... The, the, the level of the refinement that can come from this refinery so as not to allow it to compete with their operations outside of Nigeria. Yes? All right. Um, generally speaking, in spite of the exploration costs, which are written off for tax purposes anyway, yeah, so there's a, they're paying very little tax anyway, um, and many times covered by eventual profits. So in, in, in other words, the profits that these businesses make, yeah, just dwarfs any cost that they had to put into these, these endeavors, especially in uh, Africa and the Caribbean. Yeah. Mining has proved a very profitable venture for foreign capital investment, today known as foreign direct investment in Africa. Its benefits for Africans, on the other hand, despite all the frothy talk to the contrary, have been negligible. Necessary to note here as well, as part of the reason for this is the so-called shadow economy. That the existence of these corporations and the fact that they pay little to no tax and so on and so forth requires a political class that is willing to effectively rob the benefits that could be yielded from these endeavors from the nation, whilst pocketing significant amounts of cash themselves personally. So corruption is a part of the dynamic here. All right. So we're closing now, family. All right, we're closing now. And uh, feel free to click the link from here. Um, the, link, the, the, the link is pinned to the top of the chat if you're watching via Got Coach TV. So please come through to Got Coach TV. Uh, click the link from now and we'll get into some things, yeah? So even in the so-called uh, developed world and even in the context of neoclassical economics, 
yeah, as is uh, taught and operationalized through institutions like the IMF, the World Bank, the United Nations, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they are starting to realize what people like Nkrumah and Walter Rodney were saying long time ago, yeah, that you cannot measure the development of a nation purely by GDP or uh, any form of monetary value uh, and them kind of things there. And so they developed a few different uh, ways and methodologies for accounting for what GDP does not account for. Good night, Wisdom. A second, she's agreeing. All right, family. All right. So this is a, a graphic that was actually published um, by the Federal, the Federal Reserve Bank in America. Yes. Um, and it's here because it gives a visual representation to three of the tools and indices that are currently being used and or developed by various different institutions to account for what GDP and GDP per capita does not account for. One is the Human Development Index, and it focuses on people um, and capabilities, yeah? Um, and the categories of its indications are health, education, and standard of living. Uh, um, and then you have the Better Life Index, which is people's well-being, yeah? So this is that index that is trying to actually find a framework for understanding and measuring well-being categories material living conditions and quality of life and then you have the genuine progress indicator the focus is cost and benefit trade-offs of the externalities such as pollution um, and the categories for that it uses um, for measuring this is economic, environmental, and social. Yeah, now we could go into more details than this, but I'm just giving you an that have been developed in the so-called mainstream. Yeah, but if you read Walter Rodney, um, the first chapter of Walter Rodney, uh, how Europe underdeveloped Africa, you would see the basic arguments that uh, would lead to the development of these indices already. Yes, um, you know, uh, being considered within that context. Yeah, now. This is also important because those who adhere to laissez-faire, free market, fundamentalism, yeah, uh, would, would, would very rarely engage these indices, okay? Um, only when pushed and when done so, when pushed, they would even seek to uh, diminish and limit the value of these indicators. The one caveat here is obvious that some of these indicators are far more difficult uh, to collate. Yeah, it's far more difficult to collate uh, statistics, measurements, uh, and ways of measuring uh, things like well-being. Okay, but there are there are some indicators that you can use to give you an idea. Yeah, and the the question then becomes: What is the primary purpose? What primary intention is your economy serving? That becomes the, the, the principal question here, okay? So from a universal African nationalist paradigm, yeah? When we look throughout our liberation history, and that is to say Garveyite paradigm, when we look throughout our liberation history, yeah? When we look throughout our liberation history, the principle focuses of economic development have been independent self-determined self-reliant material production okay that is designed to develop services based upon meeting the needs of the people thereby improving the living standards our living conditions of the people and this is important because of the fact that what is being what we are being encouraged and seduced to do today is 
be satisfied with developing economies that are principally geared towards serving the needs of foreigners and foreign corporations. So in other words, uh, them say, well, Africa can catapult into the digital age, which means that Africa does not need to develop industrially. Uh, the Caribbean does not need to develop industrially. It can simply develop a, a digital economy. And the primary uh, factors and uh, institutions within that digital company are going to be offshore banks and uh, insurance companies and possibly tourism. Yeah. Okay. But nothing that develops and increases the material production. Yes. Um, of the people themselves. And so we're being encouraged to develop service economies for Western economic interests. Okay. All right. That's effectively it. But our movements of our history and contemporarily have generally speaking focused on in actual fact developing the material productive capabilities of our people we must produce materially for ourselves and also conceptually for ourselves but that's another subject for another time okay and so development within this context will be measured in things like schools and quality of education, number of schools and quality of education, number of hospitals and quality of healthcare, yeah, uh, and so on. All right. Again, improving the living standards um, of the people, them. All right. So, kings and queens, I believe that concludes presentation for today.